He was a doctor. He was a doctor in the war. He was born in 1905. So he was born a little bit before these other two men. And he was born in Schenectady. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Yeah. New York. Uh, he graduated from Crane Junior College in Chicago and Michigan Medical School. He entered the Medical Corps in 1930. And he was a captain and a doctor and the commanding officer of Camp John Hay, where there was a hospital there. This camp was up in the mountains of the Philippines, and it was up about a mile high, so the, it, it was a lot cooler than the rest of the um, Philippines. And the, there was a town called Baggio there that was um, their summer capital. After after um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, this was the first place it got bombed. So they got bombed, and they they were basically told by General MacArthur to go to Bataan, which is in the corner of the Philippines, and down in the bottom to the left, or I guess that's the west. And um, so all the men were ordered to go to Bataan. But there was disorganization, they weren't really prepared, and they were kind of all going down there at different times. And he joined a group called this guerrilla unit that was the first guerrilla regiment. And this was the leader of that group. And he went to the various hospitals in the area by horseback. There was still a horseback unit then. He got captured after the Bataan Death March. He did not have to do the Bataan Death March. And he was, they were still out in the, as long as they could be, but they finally had to surrender in July. And then they were taken to Cabana Juan. What this is showing here is some of the diseases that he had to treat. They had um, little... As I said before, uh, they were not feeding them enough calories. Uh, they were eating about 800 calories a day, and about 50 of it was protein and fat. And if it weren't for the bugs, they probably wouldn't have had enough protein. But the um, so they had this wet and dry berry berry, which was a B1 deficiency, a thiamine deficiency. And when they had the dry berry berry, it would affect their feet and legs. It shows the men holding their feet there. And they had trouble walking and they were lethargic. The man in the middle there that looks very heavy probably weighs a lot. These, these, some of these patients with berry berry would actually swell up to the point where they weighed 300 pounds. But it wasn't because they were getting enough food. And I, mean, I know this is disgusting, but... At times they would put them, you know, when they were carrying them, they had to be very careful because they could literally burst. And um, it affected their heart. And the men that had it were afraid to lay down at night because if they lay down sometimes that was, that was the end. So that's why I think he portrays them sitting up like that. Of course, some of them didn't make it. And they had the worst unit where the men were absolutely considered hopeless was called the Zero Ward. And I've, I've read a lot about this Zero Ward and I've heard two different theories. Some said that, that were, the Zero stood for your chances of survival. Yeah. But then I also heard that it was actually the number on the, like it was, it was actually Zero. So I haven't really been able to find that out for sure. They just buried these dead in mass graves as you can see and they carried them on window shutters to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Now these, these are the, the, I might mention to you here, these, these sketches that um, Dr. Jacobs took, he put all these sketches in a mason jar at the camp and he had to hide them because if the Japanese had found out he was doing this kind of recording, he would have been in serious trouble. So he buried, you know, he would have to bury them and get them back out. 
this is a, a sketch he did of Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Chap, uh, Chaplain Alfred Oliver. Now Eugene got married in 1937, so when he was in the Philippines, his wife was down there with him originally. And uh, once once they realized that there were problems down there, that that there were developments that were imminent that was going to be harmful, they sent a lot of the family members back to the United States. And she came back to Washington, D.C. and taught while he was in the war. So he, this is the chaplain that married them. This is a picture at camp. It shows the Japanese guard there looking over. But you can kind of imagine the sky there. The, the skies in, in Manila in the Philippines are supposed to be pretty spectacular. And he mentions in his book that that he and his wife would look at the Manila skies. Um, so while he was at camp, he, he misses his wife Judy. He sees this, he pictures her seeing the same stars and moon that he does. This is a photo he did when a typhoon hit, which were prevalent in that area. It shows everything kind of getting knocked over. This is a photo he did probably outside the barracks. Um, it's called my Kwan table here, but Kwan, it, and it's the name of the newsletter that they put out, if you'll notice. It was a generalized term similar to the English thingamabob. And it was used in many ways, but mainly in relation to food. And you could say a se <clears throat> sentence such as this. I quand my Kwan in my Kwan pot. <laughs> this is some uh, a photo he did where the chaplains built chapels for the uh, prisoners to attend uh, services. And I believe the Catholics did something too, but it just mentioned the Protestant chaplains here. But there were all denominations down there. And the chaplains really played a a large role in, in keeping these men, in keeping them to their hopes up, and giving them comfort when things got very bad. While they were at this camp, the POWs thought that if they they could grow their own food, they could have extra food, and they wouldn't be so hungry. Uh, but that isn't what happened. The Japanese let them grow their own food, but then when they finished their whole farm, they sold it to the civilians in the city close to there. And this shows one of the POWs with the caribou, the water buffalo of that area. The, another important thing with this, this, these caribou and these, this food going in out, it was used for um, espionage purposes. And there was a, outside in the museum out there, that we have a small collection of, of uh, Claire Phillips. And she, uh, she, they actually made a movie about her called Manila Espionage. Um, her husband died in Cabana Twan, and she decided she was going to try to help out the Americans. And she opened a bar, and she once the Japanese would get a little bit south, then she would get information from them and pass it on. And what they did was they carried these notes, they called them cookies, and they put them in the bottom of the rice bags. And then they would show up inside the barracks, somebody would have a little piece of paper on their bed or whatever. And that was how uh, uh, the priests also um, contributed to this espionage. We have a book called Holy Smugglers that talks about how they got, how they helped the prisoners of war. They did get caught, and it was about two years, I think, they were able to keep this undercover project going, but when they get caught, some of them were severely punished. This, um, Claire Phillips, they did, uh, they pumped people, they pumped her with water, the water treatment, and they, they were going to, and they put nails underneath her fingernails and mm -hmm. hammered them in, and, and they were going to execute her, but she got saved by the end of the, you know, they, she got saved because it's close to the end of the war. Mm. 
they did allow the Japanese allowed the men to go get a operating table, some, some surgical equipment, and an x-ray machine, and they were able to save some lives with that. And it, it appears that that was later in the war, because the date he wrote on that was 44. Once, once the, you know, some of the men, like the Joe, Joe that I just mentioned, they went over a little earlier. Um, but all these men were shipped to Japan for labor purposes, slave labor. Um, they went over on these ships. Maru stands for ship in Japan. This particular voyage was brutal. Um, right, right after they started, they got bombed. And this is a scene of the, of the bombing, and the men had to swim to shore. The ship was sinking. Some of the men did not know how to swim. Some of them, went, they make it to the shore and then get picked off there by the Japanese. And 286 men died in, in that first part of the voyage. I mean, they had just, just left and they're already getting bombed by the Americans who did not know that all, these Jap all the Americans were on these ships. After they were... Um, after they got off that ship, they, or swam the shore, they were put on tennis courts for five or six days. They stayed on these tennis courts. And it was brutally hot during the day and freezing at night. And many people, you know, more people died on these tennis courts because of injuries that couldn't be treated and, and lack of water and, and food. Next, they were put on these railroad cars to go to San Fernando. And you can see how tightly they were packed into these cars and and you know this is like the tropics so inside these metal boxes you know the temperature was you know hundred over a hundred degrees hundred twenty degrees there's several places to San Fernando in the Philippines this is the one close to Manila um, okay so now after they got off the trains they were put on boats to go to a larger ship. And you see the them jumping from the dock. That was a 25-foot jump. Some of them broke their legs trying to jump into those. There were two groups of men. There were two ships that they went on. One was the Brazil Maru, and this is the Anura Maru. This ship got bombed. <laughs> Um, and he, uh, if it weren't for these pictures that some of these men did, you wouldn't see what it looked like inside these ships. I mean, there's no, the, you know, we don't have internet, we don't have a cell phone in there, you know, so this is, this is the, our only visual representation of what it looked like inside. Um, so they, they got off that ship and went on a third ship. But by the time they got to Japan, there was only 400 of that original 1,619 that left on that ship. And all during this time, Dr. Jacobs, you know, would help with medical problems as, as best he could without any equipment. And he was quite ill by this time. I mean, they had gone from this freezing, or from the very hot weather to the very cold weather, so that, you know, the body had all that adjustment, and then all these horrible conditions on the way there. And I believe that voyage on together was like 49, 50 days. When he got to Japan, they took him over to Manchuria. He was in the same camp as the gentleman that I mentioned before, Joe Vauder. And here he sketches a um, church service inside the camp. This is a picture he drew of the layout of the camp. But you also can see some of the buildings from, from photos that Joe did. He was asked by the, when he asked the camp psychiatrist, why don't more people try to kill themselves? And he said, they were all too busy figuring out ways to survive. They didn't have time to think about suicide. Um, after the war, Eugene Jacobs 
went to San Francisco, and they all, most of the gentlemen that came back from the, the, the war, from these POW camps, had to recuperate for a long time. Yeah. And I mean, they, they had hospital ships that picked them up, and they got treatment there. Then they usually got treatment in San Francisco. Then they usually went closer to the, where they lived originally, and that some of them were in hospitals over a year. But um, he, his wife came out to meet him in San Francisco, and they returned to uh, the Washington, D.C. area. He worked at Walter Reed um, Hospital. I mean, he was a patient there, but then he also worked there. And he stayed in the military, retiring at 60. And if you can believe this, he never missed a day of work when he came home. After so much um, punishment on the body, that to me is, is unbelievable. And he wrote many articles about these POW diseases and the POW experience. He's written a book that's available online for free. It was called Blood Brothers. It gets its title, Blood Brothers comes from the fact that when the Japanese put all the men in groups of ten, and if one tried to escape, the whole group of ten would, would perish. So it was a way of keeping control over the men. But he's won many medals. He, he had, in 1947, he and his wife Judy had a little boy, Eugene Jacobs II, but they called him Little Bit. And he's passed away, and that was the only child he had. But he, he did four, he was, they were overseas. He talks about being overseas. Um, and he, like I said, wrote many articles and received many medals for his work. And he passed away in 2000. So he lived till 95. And Joe Botter, the first man I mentioned, he is still alive today. He's 95. Do you want to keep on going or you want to take a break for a minute? I have one more to go. Okay, you can do it? Good for you. So, so far we've got a painter and a doctor. 